Welcome everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. We've got a great number of people in the room. We're really excited to have you here today. I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to our executive director, Michael Smith, who's going to get us started. Welcome everyone. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, mayors, local elected officials and partners. Um, welcome to our Reimagining Policing Pledge virtual workshop series. Uh, which we're proud to co-host with our friends and partners at Cities United and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, please also allow me to extend greetings and gratitude on behalf of the 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, um, who remains an ally and a champion of this critical work that all of you are leading in your communities to make sure that we're building safe and supportive communities where all of our children can thrive. Uh, this workshop series is a part of our Reimagining Policing Pledge that we launched uh, with President Obama last month. Uh, to date, more than 150 mayors have publicly committed to the pledge, uh, and we're currently vetting hundreds more that put submissions in through our websites. Um, over the next 90 days, we are honored to have the chance to support mayors and your teams uh, that have committed to review and reform use of force policies is just the beginning. Uh, we're going to be doing a series of educational workshops that are focused on the spectrum of policing and public safety options, alternative public safety models, and community-centered review processes. Um, all of our virtual workshops uh, will be followed with curated resource materials, information on organizations that can provide additional support, uh, and an opportunity to engage in deeper discussions with local and national experts. So we recognize there's not a lot of time that we have today for Q&A, but all of our partners and speakers have committed uh, to providing a schedule of office hours that will come out after this, so you can have an opportunity to go deeper, and then we'll make sure that you have contacts if you want even uh, longer form engagements. Um, we also, over the course of the next 90 days, are going to be highlighting stories of progress. Uh, and this fall, we'll release a public report noting all of the cities that have taken the pledge uh, and case studies of reforms to date. And, you know, I think what's been really encouraging, exciting for all of us that have been uh, doing this work is watching how leaders like you are not only taking the first steps around reviewing and reforming use of force policies, but really reimagining policing, looking at how budgets are being made, looking at pairing up um, law enforcement officials with social workers and non-armed officers who can respond to all sorts of issues, uh, looking at where policing happens in schools and when it doesn't. And so we're so excited uh, to see the level of urgency and the level of commitment to truly meaningful reforms. Uh, and so we're excited to lift those up uh, over the course of the months to come. Um, we have an incredible lineup of movement leaders and change makers on today's workshop. I won't list everyone. Um, uh, but we brought the best of the best uh, because you deserve to have an opportunity to be in conversation uh, with the folks that have been on the front lines of this work for, for many, uh, many, many years. Uh, also, uh, just to give you a sneak peek on the other workshops that are coming up, next week on July 23rd at 1 o'clock, we're going to be doing a, a workshop on community-centered innovations in public safety, where we'll have uh, Patrice Cullors, who's a co-founder of uh, Black Lives Matter, We'll have Judith Brown Dianis, who's the Executive Director of Advancement Project, really looking at uh, school policing. We'll have David Muhammad, uh, who's the Executive Director of the National Institute of uh, Criminal Justice, uh, really looking at credible messengers. And we'll have Anthony Smith, uh, my colleague, who's the CEO of Cities United. Um, and then the week after that, we will have a conversation on how to create representative and open public review processes. Uh, that date is still coming together and the speakers are to be announced, but we're really looking forward with that conversation to showcase how we can move um, from just activists on one end and elected officials on the other, but really creating conversations uh, that are rooted in citizen voice that lead to community-centered change. So it's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this discussion. Uh, who is the Policing Campaign Director at the Leadership Conference. Uh, before joining the Leadership Conference, she was a trial attorney uh, in the Special Litigation Section in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice under President Obama, uh, where she conducted pattern or practice investigations of law enforcement agencies uh, and enforced consent decrees to ensure constitutional bias-free policing. Uh, so please welcome um, my fellow Obama alum and someone who has helped us put together this whole series, Linda Garcia. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's a real pleasure um, to be here today and I'm delighted to introduce our esteemed panelists for what's absolutely gonna be an important and powerful conversation. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Ronald L. Davis. Ron is the former director of the Department of Justice Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, also known as the COPS Office in the Obama administration. 
In 2014, President Obama appointed Director Davis to serve as the Executive Director of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Prior to serving as a COPS Director, Ron had a distinguished and long career in law enforcement, serving over eight years as the Chief of Police in East Palo Alto, California, and before that for 20 years with the Oakland, California Police Department. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Phil Goff, who is a national leader in the science of racial bias, who has been pioneered scientific experiments looking at the intersection of race and policing. He is a co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, CPE, and professor of African American Studies and Psychology at Yale University. CPE has the world's largest collection of police behavioral data in the in the National Justice Database, which CPE has turned into a tool to reduce inequitable policing through scientific analyses. Next, uh, we have Vanita Gupta, who I have the honor of working with every day, um, and she's a real leader. She is the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, that is the nation's oldest and largest civil rights coalition of more than 220 national organizations. Before joining Leadership Conference, Anita served as the Acting Assistant Attorney General and head of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, where she led the division's work in a number of areas, civil rights areas, uh, including, importantly, advancing constitutional policing and criminal justice reform. Prior to that, she served as Deputy Legal Director and Director of the Center for Justice at the American Civil Liberties Union. And there, in that capacity, she launched the Smart Justice Campaign to End Mass Incarceration. Vanita began her legal career at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she litigated the landmark wrongful drug conviction cases in Tulia, Texas. Uh, next, we have Changa Higgins. He is, has been a longtime organizer for policing reform and racial justice in Texas and Oklahoma. For over 20 years, he has founded and led strategic organizations, including the Harambe Brotherhood, Unify South Dallas, and Dallas Action. He brings a unique perspective to organizing, blending research, design thinking, and human-centered design practices uh, for new solutions in policing. He is currently leading the Dallas Community Police Oversight Coalition, uh, which spearheaded the creation and implementation of Dallas's new Office of Oversight in October 2019. He also serves as the Dallas Campaign Manager uh, for the Data uh, and Policing Project with the Leadership Conference Education Fund. So with that, um, as you can see, there are years and years of experience um, amongst our uh, panelists. And um, I'd like to start off, um, well, in three parts, um, really talking about identification of problems in policing, the reforms to address them, and also the challenges that folks are facing right now, given um, the current events that have happened with the murder primarily of George Floyd and the subsequent uh, demonstrations. So I'd like to start with Phil. Um, many of the incidents of police violence we know of because there has been body-worn camera footage. Um, but for every one of those, there could be hundreds that we don't know about. So what does the data tell us about police violence trends in the country? And does lack of data prevent us from having a full picture? Yeah, so thanks, uh, Linda, for the question, um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, the data don't tell us nearly enough because we don't have the right sets of data. Um, we know that law enforcement um, is responsible for about 1,000 uh, homicides per year. We know that that number hasn't done very much of anything nationally um, since those data started to be collected uh, at the Washington Post which is the best source for those data. We also know that that's an undercount, but we're not sure of exactly by how much. And then we know a whole heck of a lot less. So at the Center for Policing Equity, we collect the largest uh, behavioral database um, for officers. That's stops, arrests, and use of force, not just deadly, but the whole gamut. Um, I can tell you that in our partner organizations, we see a slight downtick, but it's, it's not anything to write home about. It's not anything to be excited about. But I'll tell you that since we don't collect data nationally on use of force stops or, or really even arrests, um, what we're doing is best guess estimates. And we can do better work in places like LA and Philadelphia and New York and Chicago, where they've got something like public data that we can do in other places where either the data aren't public or law enforcement systems aren't large enough to track that sort of thing. But even if we did, 
we'd have this other problem. And so here's something I really want everybody to understand. If we track the data, right, what we'd be able to, to talk about are disparities. So I can tell you nationally that is black people are about four times more likely to get beat up by the cops than our white people. But in good faith, none of, nobody on this call can tell you how much that four to one disparity is a result of police officer behavior as opposed to, well, that's crime or poverty or you know, uh, the employment disparities or educational disparities or healthcare, all of which happens before any police contact. So if we're going to focus on trying to measure the things that matter to us, we can't just count. We have to do analyses too. We have to, to, to deliver back to communities the portion of the disparity that belongs to law enforcement and the portion that they can't do anything about, but that still needs to be managed. This is part of the conversation when communities are calling for defunding. What they really mean is, there are social determinants to, to public safety, just like there's social determinants to health. And we got to measure all of that, and we're way behind. So it's interesting because you bring up um, the metrics and, um, and the racial disparities. Can we, I mean, a big issue is the quality of data. First of all, are officers even reporting it the right way? Are departments um, categorizing it appropriately? Are they collecting it? I mean, the question of transparency is a whole nother one in terms of publishing it and making it public, but, and moreover, standardized data across the country so that you can actually compare what's happening. How can mayors try and address those specific issues so we can get to a place where we know what's happening? Yeah, so there are best practices in how to do this. Um, and if you've got a sort of a strong mayor form of government in your municipality, you can essentially say to, to your chief, um, tell me how long it's gonna take, whatever that number is, it's too long. Go ahead and use the best practices. So AB 953, which is known as the Racial Identity and Profiling Act in California, sets up criteria for at least some basic stuff folks wanna track. Um, there is a guidebook that is available now if anybody on the chat wants to email policing equity. We wrote this in collaboration with the Policing Project and the California DOJ. We're happy to go ahead and, and share that with folks about how to move from collecting no data, collecting bad data intermittently, to collecting data that can be analyzed. But we don't have to wait for it to be standardized. Right? There are tools, data tools right now that will take all the 18,000 different ways that we collect data and we'll standardize it for comparison right now. We use it at the Center for Policing Equity and we're happy to share those tools with folks. And just following up on what you were just talking about, what are, you know, in that paper that you're referring to in California, what are the metrics uh, that mayors should think about as they're starting to undertake um, a project like this or an endeavor like this? Right, so I'll give you a couple of key metrics, but it's more than the individual things you want to track if there's a principle to it. Most of the way that we collect data around policing is for accounting and for the threat of litigation. That's not a good way to collect data for accountability and for analysis. So what you want is you want to say, all right, what questions do I need to be able to answer to make sure I've got metrics on the things I care about? not just crime, but justice as well, right? So those are gonna allow you to collect things like you must collect information on the number of contacts, not just stops, but contacts, searches, arrests, all use of forces and the categories, the location information, I cannot overstate. If you don't have location information, no one can do the most responsible best practice uh, service with your stuff. And that can be a street address. We can get the longitude and the latitude later, but you must have location and then you must have demographics, age, self-identified gender, race, ethnicity. You must have all of those elements. If you don't have them, then basic questions like how many and how equal and how fair, there's no way for even the best scientists to get at any of that stuff. Again, that's written up in, in our California DOJ report and happy to share more widely um, to anybody who's on this call. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, so uh, building on what you just said, um, Vanita, I'd like to turn to you because Phil started touching on best practices. Um, and those are really the reforms, right? And I think in the last several weeks uh, have shown the American public the need for police and reform. And so we're at a moment where there's real opportunities for change. Can you talk about the key reforms that the leadership conference advocates for? And as part of that, the evolution of policing reform that you've seen throughout your career as you've worked on this work? Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you to the Obama Foundation for putting this together, but also to all of you for joining uh, and for doing what you do every day. Um, it is, you know, policing oftentimes, and we saw this in the aftermath of Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson, 
there's often a desire to go to one reform and hope that it's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and after Ferguson, I think a lot of us saw the rush to body worn cameras as like the policy solution that was going to save the day. Um, and unfortunately, policing just is, doesn't work that way, as is the case with many institutions that are complex. Um, and that one of the reasons why the leadership conference actually launched this report and this initiative a year and a half ago called the New Era of Public Safety, um, which we will make sure gets to all of you if you don't have it already, was really to aggregate the kind of best practices around the country that police departments are deploying. These are best practices that are reflected in DOJ consent decrees, in research from uh, the office that Ron Davis used to lead, research that Phil Goff and his team have been providing data-driven uh, policy reforms that do everything from address you know, use of force and the ways in which use of force needs to be handled in the 21st century, looking at de-escalation, duty to intervene, duty to provide medical aid, looking at accountability systems, because if you can have the best use of force policy, and all of us that do this work talk about this, you can have all the best policies on the books in the world, but policy, culture eats policy for lunch. And so without training at the front end and accountability at the back end, you, none of these policies will make a difference. But looking at best practices around use of force, discriminatory policing, data collection on stops, searches, and arrests, and making sure you're actually looking at racial discrimination in your police department. Oftentimes, and Linda, you know this, when the Justice Department would go into a police department that for a pattern of practice investigation, the first thing we would find is that the police department itself wasn't doing any data collection and didn't even know the kind of depth and breadth of the problems that were in their midst. And so, but it will be a mistake for mayors and local electeds to also think that data collection alone will do will, will answer the problem. So it really is looking at this broad spectrum and it's reflected in the new era of public safety. It is informed by law enforcement, by civil rights experts, by data scientists. Um, and I think it's a really important thing. I wanna also put, and I'll, I'll say this quickly, but um, you know the problems around police violence and the demonstrations, which I think have been really quite incredible that we've seen in the aftermath of George Floyd's uh, murder, are reflecting not only hunger for police reform, but I think also fundamentally working a, a, a need to have local electeds and mayors engage in a conversation about why police department budgets may be as big as they are, why there's been a kind of almost single-minded reliance on policing and the criminal justice system to address public safety in black and brown communities. And as Phil said, some people call this defund, some people call this divest, invest, but this is a moment for actually, it connects up with the kind of broader um, focus on mass incarceration that has saddled this country for the last 50 years. But making sure that we cannot be defensive about this, but are actually kind of looking at some of these more fundamental questions, even as we engage specific reforms in police departments, um, I think is a really important thing that, that, um, that I think the country is really reckoning with in this moment. So when you bring up the fact that it's not just one policy change, um, but it has to be a whole holistic systems change, how does that, how do you go forward with that while still trying to, on the same track, reimagine public safety and what it means? So um, do you have two parallel tracks and are you undertaking the reform? Because this is a big lift for cities that want to do it. So how do you suggest that like a mayor embark on such a thing? Yeah, I mean, a really concrete way that I think mayors and local electeds demonstrate um, their understanding of how police reform connects up with this broader conversation about over-criminalized communities, over-police communities, is to just look at your departments around how your departments are in, in other social systems actually are resources to deal with homelessness, uh, people in with um, in mental health crisis or mental illness and mental health issues, school discipline. Um, these are the ways in which the rubber hits the road around what are you in your community kind of funding and resourcing as the best responses and the safe responses, understanding that in some of these situations, police are 100% necessary to be at the scene. But there are a lot of cities, Seattle, Cleveland, 
um, uh, just to name a couple, that have been trying to shift the paradigm and relying on pairing police officers with mental health professionals or having mental health professionals in the first instance where it's safe to do so, be the first responders. Um, to me, I think you'll hear this. This is where, uh, and Phil has said this too, where the protesters and the police officers come together. I mean, you will not find, and I know Ron will speak to this too, but you won't find a police chief or a police officer that doesn't understand pretty directly the degree to which they have become unwillingly the first responders on too many social issues because those are the laws that their state passed or those were, that's how the budget in their local department, and I mean, in their local um, city council has kind of structured funding and resources. So I would say, look in the first instance right there. It doesn't have to be this kind of amorphous theoretical conversation. There are ways to actually demonstrate a commitment to thinking more broadly about public safety by looking at some of these issues. Great, I do wanna come back in a second um, to talking about the city to city differences in that, but I want to loop in Ron and Chung on this conversation because I think it's really important um, as you're bringing up kind of the assessing what police do and don't do and how they do that in different communities. So Changa, um, I mean, you've been in the trenches doing the grassroots community led reform for years now. What can you kind of want, uh, articulate for us what this moment is about and what folks are asking for. Um, and really, you know, I think the questions that are rising out of this conversation about, you know, reimagining what public safety means. So yeah, that's, thanks for asking that, Linda. What, what I'm seeing that what people are saying that they want is for their city governments uh, to begin to look at other ways of, of um, uh, making the community safe. So we've been talking about reimagining policing, reimagining public safety. Um, we're hearing, you know, conversations about defunding and, and also oversight as well. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of times there, these issues are, are, are conflated with the uh, defunding movement and, and, and things, but really they, they complement each other and um, the major calls that you hear from the community is definitely for oversight and accountability. And then uh, on the other side is, is to, to begin to um, take these massive police budgets away from police departments and put that into the communities, particularly black and brown communities that, that have been historically uh, divested from, to reinvest into them with, with the money from police budgets. So, um, that's what I'm, I'm hearing on the ground. And it's important to, to remember that, um, that oversight, um, and, and particularly what I work on with oversight, um, is something that I feel like has not been truly realized, like effective oversight, even some of the more um, progressive and more effective oversight agencies across the countries and cities are still grappling with being as effective as they can be. So. Um, in that moment, what I'm pushing is that uh, people um, and activists and organizers that are on the ground that are actually pushing for defunding to not forget that a, a, a tool and a gateway to be able to get um, to divestment from the police department is to have effective oversight in their city and, and not to drop the, the victories or the work that's been done in their cities around oversight. So you, you touched on a really important um, piece of this, which is really this us versus them uh, rhetoric um, that comes up in these conversations about defund or divest and policing reform and accountability. And so to Ron, um, I wanted to hear from you, you know, a lot of the work that you did um, through the COPS office is about community engagement and building those sorts of relationships and nurturing dialogue um, in order to, you know, bring about reform in a collaborative form. What, um, what are the challenges or tensions that you see in this and how can mayors facilitate this? I think a lot of times this has to do with uh, police chiefs as well, but 
how can you, um, you know, reconcile the two, this idea of reforms that folks um, want um, and, you know, just the adversarial nature of this, uh, of this issue? Uh, thank you for the question, Linda. Can you guys hear me? I'm good. Um, I think the first thing, especially for mayors, because you, you, don't, you, ha you have to still take care of and manage your policing agencies and your employees, the also police officers, your employees. I think the first thing my recommendation would be is recognize there's a difference between police reform and policing reform. Too often we focus on police reform, which is suggesting that the vast majority of cops in this country are racist, bad, and we need a new batch of cops to come in. Versus policing reform is about the policing system, recognizing structural racism still exists, recognizing we have systemic failures, stepping away from the bad apple argument, and recognizing it's not the few bad apples. The barrel itself is very bad. The system was designed for a specific purpose in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It was a system designed to enforce Jim Crow laws and black codes. Once we basically quit making the officers the target of the anger, not the individual behaviors, but from a systemic point of view, then we bring them to the table, as Benita mentioned. There's not a cop in this country that does not agree with the idea that we over rely on police. So let's make them allies in this transition. If we're gonna reimagine public safety, well, we know they have a role in it. I think the only thing that police chiefs are very concerned with, especially from mayors, is that it's not the budget cut, it's not the defunding, it's the defunding without changing expectations. It's the defunding without changing services. That if you cut 25% of my budget, but you want me to deliver the same resources, then we have a problem. It's the over-reliance on police and make, holding me accountable as a police chief for crime reduction when we know that by myself as a police chief, I cannot reduce crime. I can displace it, I can temporarily suppress it, but there's social and, and community conditions that go to the root causes of crime, which we should be investing in anyway. So I, I think the way we move forward and how we deal with this tension is not make it punitive against the police officers. I know people are angered, people are frustrated, police violence does have a face, I know there's victims, but from a mayor's, from a, from a governing point of view, I think bringing law enforcement to the table with community leaders like Chong and others to be able to say, what is it that you should not do right now? There's some things we can stop doing today. And what's the, what's the kind of resources we can then reallocate? What is it that we should not be doing in the future? And where should we then invest the reallocation of those resources? What requires a co-responder method? How do we change the system in which you're operating? And whatever the footprint ends up being, which should be reduced greatly, how do we make sure that there is front end and back end accountability, that you're operating with the best standards of the profession? So I would say mayors, one, acknowledge that there are structural deficiencies, racism and, and, and dysfunctionality in your police department, despite the most progressive police chief you may hire. I would say also recognize that you need to sit down with your law enforcement to bring them to the table so that you can, with the community, reimagine public safety, Part of that reimagining will be a reevaluation of your collective bargaining agreements for those that are dealing with unions. And I, once again, the union is not the enemy, but the contract may be at hurdle. And so bring the union to the table and renegotiate things that right now are causing barriers to accountability. Our working conditions should not include, I can't talk to you for four days after you shoot and kill somebody. That's not a working condition. That's a barrier to accountability. That's only designed to give a bad Im image to the police, to the community. So we should go through these agreements. We should renegotiate these agreements, reimagine public safety, reallocate, but do it with law enforcement at the table. Now, candidly speaking, you'll get a lot of pushback. You guys know that better than I do, but I think this is where the community is going. This is kind of bold moves that are necessary. And if you tie into what Benita said and Dr. Phil said, that you have the data to support it, you have the community that basically reinforces it, and then law enforcement is, be, is being asked to be a part of it. And so what I'm telling police chiefs right now is, I've seen a lot of you take a knee right now. There's a lot of law enforcement that are marching with the demonstrators. But if you're gonna take a knee, now take a stand. Stand up and speak loud. Use the platform to demand a reimagination of public safety. Speak loud and demand a reevaluation of what is the role of police in our democracy and then take a look at the systems that we do have and how do we restructure them? How do we restructure, we deconstruct and restructure them so that we can re erase structural racism? So there's gonna be tension, but it doesn't have to be this much if we can 
can gather the synergy and the strength to say that law the police officers are not the enemy. We should bring them to the table. The policing system, however, is rife with structural racism and we must change it or get rid of it. So you mentioned resistance, right? Resistance um, from police officers about for a systemic change. What can mayors do um, and jurisdictions just more generally to reassure officers that reforms are not going to be harmful? They actually do improve uh, public safety and very much officer safety as well. I think for as a cop, there's no better way to, to show me or to prove something to me than to give me an example or to show me that, and I guess in an academic phrase, that would be show me the data. But if I tell you that I want to start tracking the pointing of firearms, well, the first resistance is going to be, oh, cops will hesitate, we'll all be shot and killed, we're, we're expendable. I then tell you, well, hey, Oakland's been doing it for five years, Baltimore's doing it, New Orleans doing it. These are very challenging communities, and not only are they not getting shot, but their uses of force are actually going down because you start learning things through the collection of that data, as Phil mentioned. So you have to show officers examples of where the reforms you're asking for have worked. They're not counterproductive to public safety. And more importantly, it's not treating them as expendable, right? They, we take an inherent risk to being a cop, but it doesn't make us expendable. So when you're talking about things of officer safety, it's good examples. And the great thing is over the last 20 years, I guess, plus Benita's group, civil rights, and with the consent decrees, we have a lot of examples of policies and reforms that cops thought were crazy that have been effective. They're reducing deadly force around the country and are not causing the kind of collateral damage to law enforcement. And then at some point, I, I gotta say this to the mayor, so I respect you all. Once you are going with evidence-based practices, you're going to have the resistance. As a, as a former chief, I would say this, at some point, your resistance is irrelevant to me. I no longer care. I've tried to bring you along. I showed you why we're doing it. I've given you an internal voice, kind of an internal procedural justice, but at the end of the day, that's the decision you make as mayor. That's what you order your police chief to do. If they can't get on board, they need to find a new job. This is no like, not, this is unlike any other job where you follow the directions and instructions of the people that hire you. Thanks. So, Vanito, Ron was just talking about these models or examples, right? And I think you experience this at, at the Department of Justice. When you go into a police department and you suggest some sort of reform or a new program or a new policy, one of the first questions is, well, who else is doing it? But there always has to be a first. Um, and I think right now, um, the way that the conversation is very much about innovating um, police practices, what would you suggest or recommend to mayors in terms of taking those bold steps um, and pushing for reforms um, that there might not be very, very many examples of? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so a couple of things. I think it's important uh, to Ron's point that uh, mayors and chiefs know where, in which jurisdiction some of these more bold and innovative reforms have been deployed, how they've kept crime down, how they've actually increased legitimacy of police officers in these communities and helped build trust. And there are metrics for that and we should be a resource. The Obama Foundation can be a resource. The Leadership Conference, CPE, our, Changa, like our respective organizations can certainly help provide that. But there is a move around um, innovation that I think, and a room for innovation that I think is really important. And, um, and I think, I mean, part of what the challenge is here is that there is too little that is data-driven in policing, um, and we have to increase that. So for any of you who want to help support Phil and his work, I'm going to call you Dr. Phil from now on, um, that it's really... Um, this is really important work. I do think though that there is a lot more innovation happening in policing and especially in small police departments that we may not even know about or be hearing about. Somebody in the chat is talking about the Cahoots program, there's the LEAD program in places like Seattle and other places, but in smaller jurisdictions too, um, innovation that is driving local change and um, and I, I think we should be figuring out a way to create a platform for that innovation so that we can help spread it. Our new era of public safety report helps to lift up a bunch of jurisdictions that did take the lead on a, on a lot of reforms. There's also policing associations, progressive ones, um, that have been helping to inform and push change from inside police departments on things like use of force and re-engineering use of force. When Ron and I were at the Justice Department, 
and the Police Executive Research Forum came out with the 30 guiding principles around re-engineering force. I mean, it created a lot of controversy in the field and with police unions, but it was for its time, um, you know, a really important, um, you know, set of interventions for police departments to undertake. Now, I mean, happily, I know people think nothing has changed, but it's gotten, some of these guiding principles have gotten much more, have widely adopted. Um, and I think this is the kind of thing that we need to be lifting up and supporting. And there are, you should, if you are driving something that is innovative, there are also um, organizations like the Urban Institute, like CPE, that may actually be able to come in and help measure what the impact is so that you can make the case and continue to make the case internally while the rest of us will proselytize that, that innovation. Um, great. I think we're just on time around the board, uh, about to do Q&A, but I, I just wanted to do two last questions to Changa and Dr. Phil, um, and just like one sentence answers. And Changa, if you could, um, just a short recommendation for mayors on how to engage um, the opposition um, and in order to uh, try and you know, come to some sort of consensus and, and relationship building for change. Uh, I would, my answer would be conversations are power, right? Like, so uh, I would, I would urge mayors to, first of all, identify the people on the ground who have been talking about divestment and reinvestment, oversight and defunding in your, in your city, bring those people in as stakeholders into the process. Don't leave them outside of the bubble of any reforms you're trying to create and also bring the opposition in and, uh, engage them in, in the mayor, be facilitators of the process on starting that conversation and starting that work together. Thanks. And, and um, Phil, just as a last point on that, how can and how should the mayors use um, data in furtherance of, of uh, facilitating those conversations and in really identifying the problems with the community hand in hand? Yeah, so um, we've found that oftentimes that data and science can be the table you can sit around and you can trust a process when you can't trust each other, right? Um, so um, you've heard this now for, for a little bit. The things that many of the activists and organizers are asking for, the chiefs have been asking for for the last quarter century, last 25 years that we've been doing this work, right? He say, you ask us to do too much. Um, we can't possibly get trained for all of this. I don't want my officers responding when someone's got an overdose. When someone's worried about killing themselves, a badge and a gun are not the right set of resources. So it turns out the interests of these two different groups are the same, but the history between them makes it very difficult to trust. So what I would recommend is you work backwards from the outcomes you want to see. If it's police reform, measure justice. That's what CPE tries to do is we say, this is the part of the problem that law enforcement can do something about. But if it's resource allocation, there are a set of steps there as well. You've seen in the chat a couple times that um, policingequity.org slash roadmap has been put up there. So we have, this is the soft launch for this, but a number of the cities I see on here have already been using it. We've put together a roadmap for, I'll call it the defund curious, right? The people who are interested in thinking about how should we think about this without worrying about violence, without worrying about a spike in this. You get the data together for what law enforcement are actually doing, where they can be most useful, striking, uh, fighting on the street, and where they can't be that useful, which is fighting the violence of poverty and disinvestment. And when you have that map together, you haven't made a decision that you're going to cut from this or that, but you do have a place where you can get agreement from activists and law enforcement in terms of where their interests are. And if you don't put forward, here is the position first, you'll get 90% agreement on where they want to go. They will disagree on the budget. They'll disagree on how much money they need to have. I saw questions in there about doesn't CAHOOTS or the Community Navigator programs or other programs like that, don't that require more money? Maybe, but if you cut a Bearcat out or you cut out, you cut out services that are wasteful spending and not reducing crime and not responsive to community needs, you may get way more savings out of that. The roadmaps, when we uh, roll them out in places like Fairfax and we're rolling them out in Seattle and other spots, when we roll that out, it's, it's amazing how much communities and law enforcement say, yeah, we'd like to have different resources manage this. I'll leave with this part. Scott Thompson from Camden says all the time, give me a club officers any day. We can start to measure what that real trade-off can and should be, and you're gonna get way more agreement if we don't start with, and by the way, your budget is getting cut, or, if we start with everybody's get budgets getting cut because COVID is a real thing, um, so how are we going to do this creatively so that everybody stays safe? 
we should resist the temptation to show up like we're already divided. The data can help us to do that. Right. Well, with that, uh, we will turn it over so that folks uh, have an opportunity to ask some questions. We have seen a lot of them in the uh, chat already. I just wanted to thank all four of you. I think this is a conversation that um, we could have for hours, um, but hopefully with the resources that all of um, that everyone will be sending around with uh, CPE and the New York Public Safety, um, they will be tools um, that can further uh, help inform. So I will, with that, turn it over to Nicole. 